And then when Jim walked in, he said, Job, and so Job. So then, he, you know, maybe he's never seen it before. No, he was just joking. But um, when we look at the book of Job, um, the reason we're doing it in one is because it is a survey class, and I felt like I could summarize all of Job's friends kind of quickly and look at the beginning and the end. So it's kind of bookmarked. Uh, beginning and end, get the whole just with summarizing the middle. Um, so let's look at study sheet here. The author is unknown. Okay, we just don't know. The fact is, is that Jewish tradition likes Moses as the author. Um, so the Talmud and some other writings like Moses. But we don't know who the author is. Others point to Solomon because of the poetry and similarity to some of his writings, which come up uh, right after this. And then still others say, well, maybe Job wrote it because after the events that happened, he lived another 140 years, and certainly he was an eyewitness to the things that involved him. You said, well, it wasn't written in the first person. Not uncommon to have books written in the third person, even when they're written by somebody else. So the, the fact is we just don't know who wrote Job, all right? Not really important, or God would have made sure we knew. Then the setting of this, most likely Job, this book, is set in the time before Abraham. All right, we go back a long ways. Or Abraham as one of the contemporaries of the time. I personally think it's before Abraham. I think this is the earliest reference to man. Uh, so in effect, this is like the oldest book, the oldest look um, in the Bible. There is no Jewish history listed. There's no Mosaic law listed. And many of the terms and items talked about are the same kind of terms used early in Genesis of what is called the patriarchal age, which means Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, 2100 to 1900 BC. So I do believe this book is written in that time period. Date, estimated writing, um, again, depends on who you believe. We don't really know who wrote it, so we can't say for sure. If it was written back early, but the time period around 2000 BC is when the, <coughs> the events actually occurred. The purpose of the book. Now the purpose, there's manifold purposes that could be listed. Um, the way I put it down is, I really think one of the big purposes is to reveal that God's ways are indeed unknowable to man. That when, in Isaiah, when Isaiah wrote concerning God, my ways are above your ways, and my thoughts are above your thoughts. That in fact, God's ways are unknowable to our pea brain. We don't like to think of us as being insignificant compared to God. That's why man tries to elevate himself in the position of God. But this is one of those where I believe that's one of the main things. Of course, in this book, a reason that innocent people suffer is also given, okay? Um, and we're going to look at that, of course, uh, as, as we blow through this. Then, I think the other purpose is to trust in God no matter what, no matter how, no matter where, no matter what. I think that one of the purposes of this book is for us to trust in the sovereign almighty God, even when we have no clue about what is happening. And then I think one of the other things is, I think God wanted us to have a glimpse to understand that Satan is God Satan, as one Puritan said, meaning Satan is under the ultimate control and rule of God the Father. There is absolutely, you will see in this book, God gives us this glimpse. And in fact, one of the unique features is we see a glimpse into heaven where Satan has direct communication with God. And I think, uh, you know, that's very unique in this book that gives us that look. And even when I read it again, after having read it several times ago, wow, okay, just wow, there is all kinds of stuff happening I'm totally unaware of. Um, so in the book of Job, we're going to go through this, basically looking at it from Job's perspective. So the first one is, uh, Job is blessed. We see that Job is blessed. In the first five verses, we find out, number A there, his spiritual condition. <clears throat> his spiritual condition. He is said to be blameless. The idea of blameless is undefiled, okay? It is the idea that there isn't a big black mark hanging over your name, okay? It doesn't mean sinless. Just like with elders and deacons are to be blameless, it doesn't mean sinless or none of us could be involved in the Lord's work. But it does mean undefiled, no huge mark. Number two, he is said to be upright. 
I, I think one of the biggest things that I mean a lot of I think a lot of times nowadays we kind of excuse our actions and say, well, I'm never going to be perfect. You know, I'm going to just try and live that way. But I think to a certain extent, Job, Job shows what it's like because God says He's pleased with Job. He, he absolutely does. It says um, in this context that God absolutely is pleased where Job is at as we start this book. All right. Job is no doubt one of God's. And the only way these things can be said about you, in fact, is if you are indeed one of God's chosen. And Job exhibits that. The idea of being upright is the second thing there we see in verse 1. Upright, which is the concept of being straight or right. Okay? Not a double talker. Not devious. It's like what you see is what you get with Job. Then the third thing there is he said to be fearing God. All right? Fearing God. By the way, we've dumbed down the fearing of God in our society and in evangelicalism. We've turned it into, well, it's just having respect for God. That's part of it, and it's also fearing God. <laughs> okay? And I carry this into the family situation in that when my dad would show up and I hadn't been doing what I was supposed to, there was a respect of the position, but there also was a fear of what might come from not doing right. That is part of fearing God. It doesn't mean I feared my father every time he walked in the room, but I did fear him when I knew, knowingly was not doing what I was supposed to or neglected to do what I was supposed to do. So Job is said to fear God. Number four, he is said to be turning from evil. Fearing God and turning from evil. The idea of turning from evil is a continual turning, which sounds a lot like repentance to me, which means, again, not sinless, but when you sin, to not say my sin is fine, but to turn from it, and he was consistently turning from evil. And then the fifth thing is it said that he was offering sacrifices early in the morning for his children on a regular basis. So he even was sacrificing, asking God, in case my children have, have not done right, I want to sacrifice, I want to, in effect, consecrate them to your work. So we see his spiritual condition is good and it is pleasing to God. Um, in the first chapter. Then we see his family situation. Number B is his family situation. His family situation is such that he is said to have seven sons and three daughters. Now seven is the number that represents completeness in Scripture. All right, often, 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 seven is, uh, is talked about in a completing of or a perfection of. That's why seven days in the week and seven is used often of that idea. And the three daughters. The other thing is, by the way, sons were, they were the, that was what you really wanted lots and lots of. Sons were more valued in the East. And in fact, guess what? They still are in the East. All right? Understand, the vast majority of abortions that occur around the world are on women have by far the majority. Little girls are aborted way more often than boys because boys are valued more than girls in the East. In this case, we see seven sons and three daughters. And here's the cool thing. Number two, they all got along. Okay? They all got along is evidenced by the fact they all got together and they would go to a different son's house when they would have the feasts and the celebrations. And so his family situation was blessed also. Then we see his financial position, number C there. He was enormously wealthy. It says he had 11,000 animals and many servants to care for them. And this is one of the reasons we believe this book is written about a time period that is in the patriarchal, the time of pre-Abraham or at Abraham, because wealth is measured in animals and it's an agricultural, uh, agrarian type of lifestyle and society. Now, not only that, but it also says that he was known as the greatest man in the East. All right? He was known as the greatest man in the East. Why is that important? Well, remember the Bible was written in the East, okay? We're in the West, right? America, believe it or not, the U.S. is not the central part of the Bible, in spite of what some of the heresy uh, that is taught by Mormons and others who turn the prophecy about the United States, okay? When it says he was the greatest man in the East, it is written from Eastern spot and Eastern perspective. It's talking about East of the East, Meaning, think about where did the wise men and magi come from? You remember? From the east. 
All right? So in the East, they were known and thought to be the highest level of civilization, the smartest and the brightest. He was known as the greatest man in the East. Now, no doubt, he, a lot of people knew who Job was. So when we see his blessing, we see this from a standpoint of spiritual, financial, uh, his family, in every way he's blessed. But the bulk of the book comes now, which is number two. Job is tested. Job is tested. And when we see in verse six, number A, God reveals that Satan is not equal to God, but is shown as under God's control. So Satan, and it's a very interesting glimpse, as we talked about in the introduction, interesting glimpse into heaven, is Satan and the sons of God present themselves before God. Now, I believe these sons of God are the fallen angels that fell with Satan at the time that he fell. And they actually communicate directly with God. And God looks at Satan and says, what have you been doing? He says, I'm roaming around the earth. And if we go to the New Testament revelation of Peter, we find out, what do we find? We find that Satan is like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. He is roaming around the earth seeking who he can chew up. And in this case, what happens is, number B there, Satan has conversation with God, and God presents Job as a great example of one who lives for him. Well, Satan turns around and says, well, of course he lives for you, because you hedge about him protection, you give him wealth, you bless him beyond anybody else, and the only reason he loves you is because of all of the good stuff you give him. Okay, so it was because Satan is saying it's all because of love of God to Job that you take away the stuff, and you know what? No way is Job going to continue to be in the, the same worshipful situation. So God says, all right, if that's the case, then what we're going to do is this. We're going to, I'm going to turn you loose to do whatever you want to to Job but you can't touch him physically, okay? Now, some of this is really theologically way deeper and more difficult than what we can deal with in a survey class. Uh, but here's what we know. Satan is on the leash that God puts him on. And in this case, he says, you can do this, but you must not touch him physically. So, number C there, God turns Satan loose to do what he wants. Well, in one day, in one day, guys, what happens is Job loses all of his children, all of his livestock, all but four of his servants, and those four servants who did die were the ones who proverbial lived to tell. Okay, the reason they weren't killed is so they could go back to Job and say, you're not going to believe what happened. All right? And in two cases, enemies came and attacked and killed animals and stole. And then in two other cases, we see the culprit was actually fire from heaven, and a mighty wind, all right? So was the fire from heaven, was it lightning that struck, uh, that struck and caused the fire? Could have been. Was it more divine than that? Could have been. And was the wind like a, a tornado type of wind? Certainly, uh, it sure sounds like those could be those things. So everything, folks, I want you to understand, we read the Bible too flat. We read it and we go, yeah, you lost everything. All right? You lose your job unexpectedly. And it hits like a ton of bricks. All right? You lose an account. You have a, a reversal, an upside down. And it hits you and it beats on you. All right? Now I can tell you this, that losing all ten of your kids in one accident is incomprehensible. Okay? Because parents are not wired to bury their kids. But to bury ten of them, all of them, all of them die at once. Folks, I, I want you to understand something here. That when he lost everything, wealth, kids, prestige, it all went. But I can't get over that loss of life of of 10 kids all dying under the same roof. I've watched parents who have buried kids, and it's crushing. 
I can't imagine with 10 all at once. So, what do we see? Number D, we see how Job responds to the adversity. I want to read these verses. All right, he's heard what's happened. He's lost it all. It says this, Then Job arose and tore his robe and shaved his head, and he fell to the ground and worshipped. Folks, this gives you an insight into what kind of man Job was. Because if this happens to most of us, we're angry, we're upset. Why me? Okay? But Job grieves and mourns, which is, of course, normal. All right? He grieves and he mourned, and then he worshiped God. And then notice what he says Naked I came from a mother's womb, and naked I shall return there. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Through all this, Job did not sin, nor did he blame God. Okay? Wow. I make the statement that I say it like this. Only saving faith can truly withstand the onslaught of real persecution. Okay? Only saving faith. The pretend faith and the um, seeker-sensitive faith and the health, wealth, and prosperity faith, you know when real persecution comes, you know what they do? They say, how dare you, God, and shake their fists in the hand of God. Job goes... Came in with nothing, I go out with nothing. Blessed be the name of the Lord. All right? This is an extraordinary human being who has been radically affected by his relationship with God. All right, so then what happens from there? Well, number E, Satan presents the case before God that Job only kept worshiping because his own skin had been saved when all his children and servants were wiped out. So Satan, another time, we don't know how much time passed, but he comes before God and says, hey, the only reason that Job didn't curse you is because skin for skin. He was glad that you took his kids and <coughs> didn't mess with him. That's why he's fine. Okay? So Satan does what Satan does, which is accuse the brethren and attempt to devour whom he can devour. Well, what happens now is God, number one, allows Satan to afflict him physically, but to spare his life. And what happens, we'll find, is that Satan inflicts the nastiest skin disease possible on Job. <clears throat> and this thing was nasty, all right? Scaly, painful, boils, uh, made him sick inside because it hurt so bad outside. On and on we go. This was some awful, awful stuff. Um, by the way, in the, in the process of this testing, Job's wife encourages... Well, you have to keep going. She encourages Job to do exactly what Satan had predicted Job would do, which is to curse God. So she says, why don't you just curse God and die? All right? So here we see that Job's wife is not exactly in the place of being the uh, supportive. I'm with you. In fact, she's actually wishing that Job would just die. Well, how does Job respond? Number F, he responds to this physical and verbal adversity. Um, number one there, he separates himself from others living outside along the garbage heap of the city because this disease, we have no Mosaic law, but it just obviously made sense to separate himself so that somebody else wouldn't catch whatever this was. Um, so he, he is living from the finest of the fine. Now he's living out with the dung and the garbage and the stuff that's thrown out. He was the greatest man of the East. He was the greatest man in the East. Now I'm going to talk about... I've had a bad day. Again, now we're looking at Job and seeing that a godly, upright man, by God's standards, has been totally put next to the garbage of life. All right? Um, then the second thing, Job calls his wife a fool for not trusting in the sovereign God. He says, it is foolish not to trust in God Almighty. So, his response is still hanging in there, all right? Now we come to number three, Job is visited. Job is visited. Notice it says from 2.11 to chapter 37. All right, so I'm going to summarize this. That's how you do it in one. You summarize this down. Uh, there's all kinds of, of uh, great uh, dialogue and discussion. By the way, we move into Hebrew poetry. Once we get past the historical of the first couple chapters, it is written in poetic words and poetic framing. 
And that is why it is grouped with the other poetic books that we will be uh, moving into now as we go into Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon. And so in this process, Job is visited by Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar. Okay? Tom, they can hear you. It's so much easier to say, but those are not what the Bible names are. They came together in order to comfort their friend. I want you guys to understand. Look at verse 11. It says, Now when Job's three friends heard of uh, this, is chapter 2, when Job's three friends heard of all this adversity that had come upon him, they came each one from his own place, and it names them, and they made an appointment together to come sympathize with him and comfort him. Okay, so understand their intentions are good, right? Somebody's suffering, I want to go and I want to be with them. Then look, verse 12, when they lifted up their eyes at a distance and did not recognize him. All right, you understand what that means. Grossly disfigured, discolored, and unrecognizable. All right, well, again, we sanitize scripture and read it too flat. I mean, he's a mess. He's got skin to hang him, and it's not pretty. All right, and then what did they do? They raised their voices and wept. And each of them tore his robe, and they threw dust over their heads toward the sky. Then they sat down on the ground with him for seven days and seven nights with no one speaking a word to him, for they saw that his pain was very great. So I want you to understand, they came in order to comfort him, and then they joined him, number two, in mourning, and sat silently for a week. But then chapter three, Job begins to talk about his lament, and in chapter four, we start to get responses now they begin to speak, all right, his three friends. So when they start to speak, Job wishes that he would never have been born or that he would have been born dead or that he would die right then. So in chapter 3, Job says, oh, that I wish I never would have been born, all right? Now, is that inherently wrong to wish that in the case of where Job is? I think not, all right? I think not. And then he said, boy, I wish I would have been born and, and been stillborn. And then it's like, why doesn't God just take me right now? Okay? So I don't think any of those things are uh, out of the ordinary or inherently wrong, but we see Job really struggling with, by the way, if I have a fever, I feel like I should die. Like my temperature hits 102, I go, man, I feel so bad, my head hurts. I, I mean, I feel so lousy that... It doesn't take but a couple of days and I start going, Lord, just go ahead and take me. Okay? I got fever 102. I mean, literally, it doesn't take much for a weenie like me to go, oh, I'm so tired of this. All right? Job's condition was was a hundred times worse than we can even imagine. And kind of to the point, I mean, you know, we talk about a lot of people who deal with suicide. He talks about wishing he wasn't born and the Lord would take him, but he leaves it still in God's hands. He doesn't take action. You're exactly right, Jan, and that is, it is one thing to say, I wish, I'm, I wish God would, but he does not take life in his own hands. Um, and again, it is the nature of the uprightness and the blameless stature of his view that God is in control, even in this scenario. Um, all right, so, I gotta say, because it ran through my head. So, Rich Mullins, if I got time, I wanna play a song at the end of this uh, that corresponds nicely. But Rich Mullins has a song called Elijah. And it's When I leave, I wanna go out like Elijah, with a whirlwind to fuel my chariot of fire. When I look back on the stars, it'll look like a candlelight on Central Park. And it won't break my heart to say goodbye. The it won't break my heart to say goodbye. And then in one of the verses, he says this he says, some friends are concerned about my soul, but I assure them I'm not ready until God says it's my time to roll. Okay? So what he was saying is I'm not taking it in my own hands even when I have those feelings. So that corresponds with what Jan was saying. Uh, saying. Well, Eliphaz, Eliphaz speaks first and states that the innocent never, ever suffer. All right? That's what Eliphaz says. The innocent never suffer. And that Job should repent of whatever sin he did to cause God's discipline on him. All right, so that's Eliphaz says, there's no way that God would ever cause you to suffer unless you've sinned. All right, 
Now, it's easy for us to look at this in the light of having the revealed word of God in Job and other places to realize that's not true. It wasn't as easy back then. We're talking early. There's not a tremendous amount of revelation here. So I'm going to cut these guys some slack, and you're going to see, thank heavens, our God cut some slack too. Well, and to the point, we're, I mean, how many times we sit there and we, I think a lot of, another problem of modern Christians is that things start to happen to us and we go, have I done something wrong? Have, have I offended God? Or we, we kind of attribute the same things that they are and that we see punishment and reward as being um, examples of what we're doing or, or, and stuff like that. And we have, a again, an entire slew of popular preaching that says, if you just had enough faith, you wouldn't have any problems. Okay? If you just had enough faith, you'd be rich like me. All right? You'd be happy like me. And we are susceptible to that drip and drip and drip of false teaching that says all you ever have is glorious, wondrous blessings when you have enough faith like me. All right? So the straight out of Compton little memes that were going around, my favorite, Clint showed me, was showed a picture of Smiley Osteen holding his Bible. The only time he ever holds it is when they pledge allegiance to it and then put it down to never be seen again. He's, it said straight out of context. That was my favorite of those. So um, in this case, we see life that says only the innocent, um, or the innocent never suffer, okay? And Job should repent. Job begins to wish his friends would truly, would truly comfort him rather than condemn unjustly. All right? Then Bildad speaks. By the way, we think Eliphaz spoke probably was the oldest. And when we get to the end, when God deals with the three friends, he addresses Eliphaz in regards to being the leader of them all, probably because he's the oldest. The Bible looked at the eldest as being in the place of authority and responsibility. Number C there, Bildad speaks and accuses Job of speaking words that are just plain wrong. And he confirms God only judges sinners and rewards the righteous in his message to Job. Well, Job responds that God is justified in punishing anyone that he chooses, but he longs for a mediator to represent him before God. You've got to see this in chapter 9. Look at chapter 9, verse 32. It says this. This is Job speaking in response to Bildad. He says, For he is not a man as I am, that I may answer him, that we may go to court together. Does that sound like a legal phrase? It is a legal phrase. And he says, There is no umpire between us who may lay his hands upon us both. Let him remove his rod from me, and let not dread of him terrify me. Then I would speak and not fear him, but I am not like that in myself. So we see even in this early, early, early Old Testament book, the idea of Job longing for a mediator. And then we get over to the book of Timothy, written by Paul in 1 Timothy 2.5. The completeness of the revelation, there is exactly one God and one mediator between God and man. The man who could touch humanity and touch God. It is Jesus Christ. And this book, again, begins to point to the Savior who is to come. Well, then we see Zophar tells Job that God should give him even more judgment because of the way Job, Job is speaking to God. So Zophar says, hey, you're getting all this. You, you know, you're almost dead the way it is, and you look terrible. Uh, but you should be getting more because of you questioning God and asking why. Okay? Job really wants to know why. Well, Job responds by accusing his, uh, his friends of pretending to know everything when only God knows all. I mean, he really said, you guys think you know it all. God's the only one that knows. And then it says in the context, he wishes they could have stayed silent like the first seven days. So after a while, Job's like, you know, the first seven days were perfect when you guys didn't say anything. You're making it worse now. He actually, I, I, I think it's funny when he gets there because he actually slams them a couple of times like that. Like, you all are just, you know, it would have been better had you all been just quiet. Can't you keep that way? And thus there is an application for us too. Because when we come into people's lives of suffering, boy, we better be really careful about what we say. And in many cases, you know what we should probably say? Put an arm around them and hug them and probably say not much of anything. Because we really don't always know, do we? Now, if we know there's a cause that we know for sure, but these guys didn't know of any sin. Job kept saying, what sin are you talking about in my life? They couldn't identify it, but they kept blasting it. All right? There is an application there, too. All right, so where are we? Um, number E, in the middle of being blasted by his friends, Job worships God. All right? 
So this goes on for a while. We see in chapter 19, and I almost see like this, you know how they say when somebody is really sick, sometimes like right before they die, they kind of revive. And like there's this all of a sudden coherent, like, and it's like I almost see this. And when Job, it's like, he transcends into worship out of the most intense pain and being brutalized. And look what he says, verse 23 of 19. Oh, that my words were written. Oh, that they were inscribed in a book. There's his plea. And guess what? They are. All right? God answers his prayer. We're reading them today because God Almighty hears Job in his trouble. It says that with an iron stylus and lead, they are engraved in the rock forever. And indeed, this word of God is forever. Then it says, as for me, I know that my Redeemer lives, and at the last he will take his stand on the earth. Even after my skin is destroyed, yet my flesh I shall see God, whom I myself shall behold, and whom my eyes will see, and not another. My heart thinks within me. If you say, how shall we persecute him? And what pretext for a cause against him can we find? Then be afraid of the sword for yourselves, for wrath brings the punishment of the sword, so that you may know there is judgment. So to summarize this, number one there, he prays that his words would be engraved in a book, and they are. Number two, he acknowledges the need for a redeemer, all right? He hopes, number three, in a living redeemer, all right? It's one thing to be redeemed, but do we have a living redeemer in the Lord Jesus Christ, all right? Again, pointing to the New Testament, that three days after he paid the price for our sin, satisfying God's wrath on my sin, Jesus comes back from the grave. And he is indeed the living redeemer that Job hoped for. Number four, he believes one day he will see God face to face. All right? How much revelation did Job have? Not nearly as much as I do, but his theology was awfully good for limited theology because he believed God and trusted him at his word. Then number five, he knows that God is righteous and just in all his activities and judgments, all right? God could take me out right now, and he is absolutely just in doing so. He can take out a tiny baby, and he's just in doing so. We don't like it. We don't like, we want it to be our way. But the fact is, God is righteous and just. Job worships in the midst of this horrible situation. Number F there. His three comforters turned tormentors continue ratcheting up their individual accusations of Job's responsibility and God's judgment on himself because of his personal sin and unwillingness to repent. Job truly wants to know the reason for his suffering. He really is pleading with God, please show me. Have a meeting with me. Tell me, why is this happening? All right? He's pleading with it. But his friends continue just to double down on your, you've sinned, God's punishing you. So the comforting really gets to the other extreme. Then we see this guy named Elihu. Elihu is a younger observer of this entire scene. So he is watching the three friends address Job. And he's a younger guy that's keeping his mouth shut and just listening. But finally, he gets to a point, and he speaks into the situation. Well, when he speaks in, he not only blasts Job, but he blasts Job's three friends. All right, so he blisters the three friends, but he also blasts Job. One little difference, though, is Elihu is really blasting Job for some of his statements and attitude toward God during this time of being uh, blistered, literally, in his skin and all. In other words, Elihu is saying, the way you've responded at times to God is not right here. All right? He is younger. As a result, part of his, you kind of see in the way it's worded, he's a little bit of, uh, he knows it all. Like I said, I, I don't remember if I said to Clint or Mike, or one of them not too long ago, I said, well, you know, when I was final, it was about the divorce issue. When I was 20 years old, I knew exactly how it was. But at age 30, 40, and 50, I go, it's a little more complex than I thought it was at 20. In other words, some things when you're 20, you think you absolutely, I know exactly how they are. But you find out, hmm, maybe it's not quite that simple. Well, that's a little bit of Elihu. So what happens is, much of what he says is accurate, is regarding the character of God, and that Job's comments to God, God were inappropriate during his suffering. But he is of no comfort to Job either. All right? So... He basically comes in, has a lot of good things to say, 
But he's not exactly right either. He's still accrediting Job's original suffering to sin. And we know from this total uh, of the uh, revelation that that is not the case. All right, but the story doesn't end with Job brutalized and with his friends tormenting him. But it begins to come to a conclusion in chapter 38 when God speaks to Job. I thought Job is restored. So Job is blessed. Job is tested. Job is visited. Job is restored. God blows into the scene, number eight there, in a whirlwind with his mighty power and words. All right? So God shows up, and there's no doubt when God shows up. His presence is there. And in the whirlwind, I find of some interest because of... We think about God speaking and the natural phenomenon, even on the mountain we saw with Moses and the things that occurred. And we see this idea of a burning bush and God speaking. He gets people's attention when he speaks. There's no doubt it's God. So he roars in with this mighty power and words. The first thing he does, he addresses Job's attitude and complaints during this time of physical destruction. So God actually does say to Job, who do you think you are to question me? All right? This is important to understand because some people get stuck here and they say, well, see, Job should have repented from the get-go. No, God decides to let Satan test Job and he allows it to happen because he's going to prove to Job, to Satan, and to indeed the rest of the world that saving faith can change you forever. All right? And it is here that this happens, that Job begins at times during those chapters I summarized to go, why, God, why are you doing this? It's unfair. You're brutalizing me. You don't really care about me. That kind of an attitude. What I'm saying is, is that is this a normal human response after days, weeks, and even months of torment? The answer is yes. But God even comes in to address Job first. And he says, Job, you have had some inappropriate things. And then he goes to this. He addresses his attitudes, number A there. He basically tells him, you are not God. <laughs> okay? You are not God, and my ways are way over your head. All right? This is the idea of Isaiah when he said, thoughts and ways of God are way above my thoughts and ways. And God lays it down in number B. You cannot even understand the basics of creation. He gives some very detailed stuff. Do you know how this happened? How this happened? How this happened? How this happened? And you know what? When I read those things, I go, wow. God just summarized it for us in Genesis 1. said he created. What God's saying to Job is, you have not a clue how I did it. Never will because I'm God and you're not. Then number C. You have no idea how to create tame, wild, bizarre, or giant animals and supply them with all food to live. All right, so literally he starts talking about Leviathan, uh, he's talking about behemoths, talking about stuff like dinosaurs, giant sea critter stuff, and God created it all. He says, you don't have any concept of it. You don't know diddly squat. All right, that's what God is saying uh, in paraphrase to Job. Well, how does Job reply, number D? Job replies in repentance for his complaints against God as he is more blown away than ever before at the power and majesty of the Almighty Maker of heaven and earth. Look at chapter 42, verse 5. This is what Job says. I have heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees you. Folks, I want to tell something. When you go through suffering, real suffering, and you go through real pain, you will see God in a fresh, new way. It's one thing for you to say, oh, I trust God. It's another thing for you to trust God in the middle of. So many times, God allows us to go through difficulties in life to see that He is trustworthy and to let us know how great of a God He is. Job looks at God and says, sorry, okay, sorry for ever questioning you, all right? And he repents before God. Well, then God addresses Job's three friends and tells them they need to repent of their many inaccurate statements and have Job sacrifice clean animals as a priest on their behalf. And he addresses Eliphaz and he says, you guys need to get seven uh, and seven, 14 animals, bring it. Let Job sacrifice for you as your priest on your behalf. Now here's the really cool part of the story that I've never really quantified in my head before is two points here. Number A, they do as instructed. 
They do exactly as instructed, indicating personal repentance. All right? They didn't say, I'm not doing that. I was just doing my best, because that's how I get. I get defensive when I get told I'm wrong. Okay? Anybody else ever get a little defensive? Somebody says, you did that wrong? It's like, man, I'm ready to fight. No, you know what they said? Personal repentance. They go get the animals. They bring them. And then here's the other cool thing. Is look at verse, uh, this is in 7 to 9. It says, so Eliphaz the Timonite uh, and Bildad the Shuhite and Zophar the Namathite went and did as the Lord told them. And the Lord accepted Job. So you understand, number B here, is that God hears Job's prayers on their behalf, showing his gracious forgiveness. You see, not only is Job forgiven for anything he said inappropriate to God during his time of testing, but God comes in and says, you three that have made the situation worse, said all kinds of incorrect things, you need to ask forgiveness, have Job be your priest, have him pray on your behalf, and guess what? God accepts it all, meaning God forgives those three guys for doing the wrong thing. What a great God we have who forgives all of our transgressions. Then we see in the final, God restores with manifold blessings at the end of chapter 10, uh, 42, starting verse 10. We see that there are times of food, fun, and fellowship with family. It says his brothers and sisters who knew Job could come to him again. Because don't forget, while he was falling apart physically, nobody could be around him. I mean, they're not going to be able to uh, have any sort of, There's no Thanksgiving or Christmas dinner, right? All right, so now they can come together. and There's time of food, family, fellowship, fun. Then we are told that twice the amount of wealth that he previously held he gets. So his wealth doubled. God doubled his wealth. And then number three, he ends up with ten more children. God gave him seven more sons and three of the most beautiful daughters in the land. The Bible points out their beauty, which is interesting. All right? The other three daughters probably weren't as good looking as those three. Now, here's what I'm going to tell you something. Does those ten replace the other ten? Of course not. God has just blessed him with ten more. The memories and the love he had for those first ten, they're still there. All right? But God has blessed him with these additional children. And then number four, another 140 years of seeing the younger generations from his sons and daughters. He's given 140 years to live. Folks, I want to tell you something. From watching grandparents with grandkids, the only thing that can be better is grand grandkids and being able to see that. In other words, the blessing of seeing those little ones, Job got a chance to see it with his 10 kids and the generations that came. We're talking about a guy who lived over 200 years by the time he gets done. It's another reason we believe it is in the patriarchal age because of the time of life that he lived. Now, real quickly, I'm going to play at least part of this, and this is a song by Rich Mullins. The song was written by Mullins and never recorded in a studio because he died before he got to the studio. He recorded it on a cassette tape inside of the church himself playing the guitar. Then some other Christian artists came and they actually recorded the album in the studio. Are you with me? So this song is called Hard to Get. And I want you to understand how the reason I'm playing this is how I believe it connects beautifully to Joe. And if I cut it off, it will only be because of time.
us Still we do love now and then Did you ever know loneliness? Did you ever know need? Do you remember just how long a night can get? When you were barely holding on And your friends fall asleep See the blood that's running in your sweat Will those who mourn be left uncomforted? While you're up there just playing hard to kill Bless the service to follow the Lord and the bless all the activities of the day and we pray these things in Jesus' name.